as several of you asked me to do a video on women wrestling or women wrestlers who appeared on the cover of the magazines I thought sure you know piece of cake it wasn't a whole lot of women on the cover of, of the magazines and should be pretty easy yeah right um, what a lot of research and gathering and uh, you name it it was a lot of a lot of time putting this little bit of a material together because women wrestling was all over the place um, it wasn't structured and set like men's wrestling and you'll see as as we go forth so uh here we go I'll give it my best shot now it's hard to uh just throw a bunch of magazines up with a bunch of women that no one knows who they are. It wouldn't be fair to anybody unless I went backwards a little bit and discussed the history of women wrestling. And I really don't want to do this, but I, I don't really like to you know, discuss certain topics and histories. I just more or less like to show the magazine cover and let the magazine do all the talking. But um, I, I feel it's important to get a better understanding on who some of these women's uh, were and, and what they've had to go through to uh, make it as hard as it was for them to make it with you know not having equal rights to discrimination to racial divide and racial discrimination uh, especially in the southern uh, part of the country here in the United States um, it, it got uh, it got pretty hairy so it's important for us to look back at these fine ladies and understand who they are, what they did for the sport of professional wrestling, and how uh, they, they paved the way for the future of ladies wrestling as they see it today. Now, you might be wondering who is this old lady I'm looking at here on the screen. You are looking at the very first ever world woman's uh, champion wrestler. Her name is uh, Cora Livingston. And here she is with her championship belt. She was, uh, uh, well, before I get into who she was, it, it, let me back it up a little bit. And finding any information about women wrestling prior to, say, 1910 and down, uh, and finding anything where it was structured and, and, and with statistics and, and written and logged for, there's, it's almost nothing. Um, Basically, we didn't get anything solid or written in stone uh, until about 1911, 1912, somewhere around that time period. Um, Cora Livingston um, was a real strong woman, built like a brick shit house, had muscles on top of muscles, and was just had that freakish strength and enjoyed, you know, the combat of uh, combat of arts and the combat of styles and, and fighting, and um, became a, a lady wrestler. It, she ended up um, in October of uh, 1913. She fought for what was going to be the first World Women's uh, Championship against uh, Laura, a woman named Laura Bennett. It was a one fall match that went a little bit over 12 minutes in Kansas City, Missouri. And Cora came out the uh, first ever recorded champion. <clears throat> and um, Women weren't necessarily in the arenas at this time period uh, in 1912, you know, 13, 15. Uh, they were kind of traveling around with the, um, the carnival scene, the, uh, the circus scene. And they also, believe it or not, went to like burlesque uh, uh, gentleman clubs and wrestled there and had their matches there. So it wasn't real popular for women to be uh, in an arena at that time period uh core and here's i took some different shots from them i don't like to open up my 50s issues very often so i took some screenshots and 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 uh copied them and paste and developed them here just so i could show you a little bit bigger and without having to mess up my magazine uh here is cora she's defending her world title in 1920 at the howard um burlesque uh theater uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. And here was the ad and how it was written. And you can see, you know, it was the, the Puss Puss Burlesque Club. And uh, she would be here for one week. I know you can't see it, it's really small, but she's, it says Cora uh, is here to take on all comers for one week. Step up to the challenge for a chance to win $25. Take on the champ, see if you can defeat her. Uh, so she would basically travel, go to a place like this, spend the week there, 
and uh, you get a crack at her for her title, or you get to sit back and watch the, you know, the matches back then, which some of them supposedly were shoots. Uh, I don't know, you know, the whole history of how it worked back then in the early 19 teens. And, uh, but it, I would, you know, she was, was known to, to go up against a couple of men and, and beat the men. And if you take a look at this shot of her here, you can see why she could handle herself against men. Um, the size of her shoulders and arms and traps. I mean, the woman was put together. This is another ad. Um, for, let's see, uh, uh, shoulder muscles of the world women's mat champ um miss uh living stin is oh she's coming here to st louis to uh take on uh all challengers at the strand theater uh winner could get 25 dollars if they faced uh miss livingston the champion so i thought it was important just to show the first champion where she came from brief little history on what i have and only know of her what i have learned through the magazines and um, sometimes that's the best way to learn um, you know keep everything kayfabe and i just discuss whatever the magazines say and once in a while i'll drop the truth in there but uh you know we suspend our belief and we just use our imaginations and keep kayfabe alive and that was what was so great about it and what's missing today because everybody wants things exposed and you just all you did was expose all the fun out of it and it's, it's a shame um so there was a uh, phantom match uh, miss livingston went would go undefeated but it would be written that uh, she would lose the title to miss mildred burke here's my earliest uh, photo of uh, mildred burke with the uh, nwa world title now in 1950 so it was said that um this a quick history for people who don't know who Mildred Burke is. Uh, she's a woman who started wrestling in 1935 in the carnivals. Um, her too would face men. It was documented that she faced over 200 men in her time. They were usually within 10 minute bouts. It was basically you come in and see if you can pin the champ to the mat uh, in 10 minutes. And if you did, you would win $50 or $25, whatever you know the purse may have been. And, uh, and she claims you know, to have been you know, undefeated. As she uh, climbed the ladder um, of, uh, of, you know, doing like the carnival circus uh, type of uh, territory scene that way, uh, she had worked her way over to uh, uh, Billy Wolf and started a relationship with him and would be married to him at one time. He was known as being the, the booker and the promoter for all the women's wrestling. If you wanted to, you're a woman and you wanted to wrestle, you needed to see Billy Wolf. He would be the one to get you started out. But it was said that she had, um, Mildred Burke had defeated um, Cora Livingston in 1936 for the title. Uh, other places will say that uh, Cora had retired, the champ had never lost. Um, I've seen photos to, uh, of these both girls, women together, but not in the ring actually, but both of them standing with each other. Uh, so who knows if the match ever happened, but you know, the next person to take the reins would have been Mildred Burke after Cora. She's now, you know, following the lineage, the lineage of the WWA world women's, uh, wrestling association or world women championship. It also went by WWWC world women wrestling championship. There's a bunch of different abbreviations for that title. This title is still in existence today in Japan. It's still defended in, uh, and, uh, all Japan uh, Women's Wrestling League. Separate from Giant Bob is All Japan. This is just strictly Women's All Japan. So um, so she would become, uh, at this point uh, in 1948, she would merge her championship belt and become the NWA uh, World Women's Champion, recognized by the NWA in 1948. So Cora Livingston's championship had started for her in uh, 19 whatever I said, 16 or 12, um, that title now is merged in with the NWA. And we're going to get back into that in a minute because things get a little screwy here when they start off with their first uh, screw job. Yep, it even happened to the women early on, probably more so than anyone else. But um, this is my earliest photo that I have of uh, Mildred in 1950 uh, with the belt. Here is a program of Mildred without wearing the title uh, in 1949. Patterson Armory uh, in New Jersey. This is May 18th title match against the original Texas Tornado June Byers and June Byers is here 
they're about to have a lengthy history, uh, these two, um, and I'll explain in just a little bit. So, like I said, this is my earliest uh, program that I have uh, for an NWA women's title match. Um, I have a couple of other programs from the 40s from the NWA, just not uh, women. So this is the only one I had that was woman dominated and with Mildred being the headlining uh, of the match. And uh, it's a pretty cool little program. I don't want to take it out. A lot of these stuff from the 50s, I'm not, I don't want to take out. So I took pictures with my phone and I just printed them so I could show them because they're so delicate and I don't want them screwed up and I'm like, you know, anal with it. I don't want like fingerprints and shit all over them. So I'm trying to keep them as neat as I can because these 50s issues are really hard to find. So, like we said before, the magazines had just gotten started in 1950, January of 50, and that started off with just Wrestling Magazine. In April of uh, 1951, uh, official wrestling started. So, January 51, Wrestling Magazine, and then in April started Official Wrestling Magazine, the separate company, and we explain all that in our uh, 1950s issues that we cover. And the first time a uh, woman will appear on a cover of a wrestling magazine that was widely spread for mass consumption and distributed all across the country, August of 51. And it's got um, uh, Mae Weston on the cover uh, doing the Adam's apple choke, which was her finishing choke hold. And uh, the referee was none other than Jack Dempsey, former world heavyweight boxing champion. So these are the first uh, two ladies on the cover of a wrestling magazine uh, this early on. Uh, there's only a handful of issues released at this point. And here it is. The other, mag the other wrestling magazine, just called Wrestling Magazine, that went from January to April, they didn't show any women on the cover. It was just these official magazines that were actually owned by the NWA. I know it's a lot of information to hear. The um, next issue, August 1952, and this is showing uh, Miss Nell Stewart. Nell Stewart is the NWA United States Ladies Champion, <clears throat> and uh, she'd be making her first magazine cover. She was really popular in the uh, early 50s. She was favorite to uh, become the NWA Champion. Just never happened. Came real close for once, but was never able to make it uh, as champion. Uh, um, yeah, so I'm out of order with this one. This is January, I'm sorry, June of 1963. But I want to talk to you about a wrestler named J Janet Janet Boyer. And uh, this is actually the adopted daughter of Billy Wolf. Um, uh, she had a match and she was killed in the ring, accidentally, obviously. But... Uh, it, it was a sin. She was um, she was in line next to become the next uh, NWA ladies champion and was on her way to doing so. Um, she had a match with uh, Ella Walnick and uh, didn't feel real good during that match. Felt like she was going to like pass out and was lightheaded, but got through the match. <clears throat> and then a little later on that night, in the card, down the card, uh, she was, had to compete again in a tag team match. Um, uh, Ella, again, only this time with Ella's tag team partner, would be the the crazy uh, off of her rocker, Johnny May. Um, many other people would know Johnny May today as uh, Miss May Young. Um, May Young was basically the. Uh, uh, Buzz Sawyer of the female wrestlers, completely nuts and out of her mind. And her arrest sheet uh, is as long as her match list sheet from for matches that she's had. She's been arrested so many times for so many different crazy off the wall stuff. She's uh, definitely wacky. So she ended up using this in her angle, playing this death off, which is kind of tasteless, but kind of fitting for Miss uh, Johnny May. Um, the article that I'm describing to you right now with Johnny May and uh, Ella Walnick and, and her getting killed was covered in the Columbus Citizen Mag uh, newspaper in uh, July of 28th of 1951. And this article of Wrestling Review kind of paraphrases the uh, newspaper article explaining what happened. It said that she had uh, eaten, a, she had a lot of food before the match 
it was she had potatoes beans and some kind of meat some kind of greasy meat and she took a drop kick from ella into the stomach which caused her to internally choke i don't know how, how that's possible i don't know what that means she uh apparently collapsed in the ring uh stomach burst and uh she suffocated i guess on her own food and died uh before the ambulance had even gotten there to save her. Billy Wolf, was, this was his uh, adopted daughter, and he took the death extremely, extremely hard. Um, article goes inside to talk all about that. If you're interested in the story and learning about Janet and how she was killed, it's really a shame. Um, she never got her chance to uh, make it famous, and uh, you know, here's a look at what would have been our women's NWA uh, world champion right here had she had not had that freak accident and pass away. So all of that is covered in the Wrestling Reviews June of 63. It kind of overshadows the beautiful Ann Casey uh, here on the middle picture here, who's uh, one of my favorite 60s uh, wrestlers, lady wrestlers for sure, a very attractive woman, uh, is also featured uh, in this wrestling uh, review. <clears throat> Next issue, now we're finally getting to see our first um, NWA ladies champion. Uh, the, pr the proper name is lady wrestler uh, and lady champion, not girl wrestler, not woman wrestler. They are wrestlers in the ring and they are ladies outside the ring. And that's the proper term back then and probably should still be today for the lady wrestlers is uh, lady wrestler, not girl wrestler or woman wrestler. Um, but here, an NWA official, um, May of 1953, first shot at Mildred Burke, and she's announced as the women's champion. And uh, uh, up here, we see June Byers and uh, Mary Jane Null. They are the NWA ladies tag team champions. June Byers, who we just seen a few minutes ago at here, was taken on uh, Mildred Burke for the title. She is also the daughter-in-law to Billy Wolf. Um, Billy Wolf, who we mentioned earlier, you know, you wanted to wrestle, you're a woman, and he, uh, he, was, he was the promoter. You know, he basically took uh, wrestling out of the circus and brought it into the arena is what made him most popular. Um, but inside the issue here, let's see, um, we have a look at Miss Cora Combs, and she is with the NWA uh, Southern Ladies Championship, and that Southern Championship is a trophy. And you can see here, here with the trophy, it was a defended trophy, not necessarily a defended belt uh, early on in the 50s. Uh, later on, of course, the ladies United States belts and the Southern belts and this and that were all actual belts, but this championship here were uh, trophies. Um, there's also a shot of Billy Wolf in here for people who don't know what Billy Wolf looked like. Uh, him right here with the glasses. And he is seated here with Miss Nell Stewart, who's the United States champion. And they're at uh, fine dining at a restaurant uh, called the Stork Club. And, um, you know, as you can see, she's decked out the rings and the furs and the pretty clothes and the tables loaded with drinks and foods and whining and dining and looking good. Billy Wolf in the magazines. So it's just uh, this issue of May of 53. So hang on to your hats because things are about to get a little bit crazy in the wrestling biz. Um, <clears throat> next issue. Uh, very hard issue to find, and this is your first look at the NWA World Woman's Champion, World Lady Champion, June of 53. Hard issue to find. I don't. I didn't want to open this issue because I didn't want to um, <clears throat> screw it up. Uh, so I took photos, like I said, with my phone and printed them. So I'll be showing you some stuff in here in a second. But uh, April 14th, 1953, Baltimore... Uh, Coliseum, there was a 13 woman um, battle royal, uh, and, the, and the final two contestants were to have a match f to crown the new NWA ladies champion. And you're like, well, wait a second, Mildred Burke's a champion, right? If you look right here, it says Mildred Burke, uh, world's champion from 1936 to 1953. 
Hmm, last month in the April issue, she was the champion. Now in the June issue, she's no longer the champion. I'm sorry, the May issue here, when they were announcing her as the champ, she's no longer the champ. Uh, what, what happened? So, as I was saying, they, there was a tournament held uh, in Baltimore, or a, a battle royal, and um, uh, the final two contestants were uh, Nell, um, I want to make sure I get all this correct so I don't screw it up. Yes, Nell Stewart, who was the U.S. champion, uh, and uh, June Byers was the other finalist. Now, they, uh, Nell was a big favorite to win this tournament because she already held the U.S. title. But uh, June uh, apparently wiped the mat with her in just over five minutes for the pinfall, and she won the championship. Inside the magazine is a photo of June getting the <clears throat> championship belt given to her. And then here's the article here. I'm just going to paraphrase some, but I'll read the telegram that was sent over to the NWA commission. Um, okay, as it states, uh, to be sent... Western Union to Telegram. Okay. In the girls' tournament tonight held here in Baltimore for the World's Women's uh, Wrestling Championship sponsored by the Maryland State Athletic Commission, I wish to announce that June Byers won the tournament and has now presented with the official NWA World Ladies Championship belt signed James T. Holmes, Chairman State Athletic Commission. And here was just the article that's inside with several more pictures. And this is June with the uh, championship belt. This is also inside the magazine. Hard issue to find, very expensive. And uh, if you can find one, all your history that I just read to you uh, is right in there. Now, some of you might be saying along with myself, what about Mildred Burke? I thought she was the champion. Well, she is. And Mildred was married to Billy Wolf. Billy Wolf got caught with his pants down and caused those two to have a divorce. So I guess now if you're divorcing Billy, the promoter, the, uh, uh, the, the guy, the matchmaker, the guy who does all the ins and outs of booking your matches, I guess you're no longer the ladies champion. June Byers who's the new ladies champion now just happens to be Billy Wolf's daughter-in-law. So she's married to Billy Wolf's son. So they have two uh, world champions running around. One is the NWA champion and Mildred continued on business as usual. She had her, still had her bookings and she did her own booking. And uh, she is the world women's championship holder that she beat uh, Cora Livingston for. So she's continuing on and she's defending her title. June now is continuing on and she's defending the NWA title. Fans were like, well, what the hell? You know, why do we have two ladies champions? We, let's, let's settle this. So the match was uh, decided to be made. <clears throat> and um, it was uh, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, August 20th, 1954. It was to be a two out of three fall match, winner take all, and we'll merge the titles together. Uh, what had happened was um, June got the first fall uh, by submission over Mildred. That second fall had turned into a shoot, and it got, from what I read and heard, got really ugly, a lot of hair pulling, kicking, name calling, punching. Uh, people knew something wasn't right. They were seeing something quite different here. Um, after an hour, the commission stepped in, called a stop to the match and called curfew. That was common back then, even in, the, in like New York. If I remember the garden, if it went past 11.30 p.m., uh, the matches had to be called uh, due to curfew because of some bullshit laws that they had. They'd have to stop the match. So nobody really thought twice about it. They figured it went to curfew and the match was finished, but there was no you know apparent ending to it. Both ladies walking out. Mildred leaves thinking she's the champion and only to find out through another telegram later that June Byers was declared the winner because she had held one fall over Mildred and she had defeated Mildred Burke for the NWA world title. So talk about a screw job twice now, Mildred's getting screwed out of it. So uh, long story short, June Byers is now, has the throne of the NWA ladies title and continues on for the next 10 years or so as ladies champion. 
Mildred Burke would continue on her path defending uh, Cora Livingston's WWC, WWWC, WWL, whatever you want to call it, title. And like I said, that WWL is still uh, carried on today in Japan. So the titles had a good future, both had a good future because they're actually both still in existence today in some shape or form. So that's the uh, official, whether it be kayfabe or whether it be the official official, that's the story on the ladies' champions right there with the great Mildred Burke. I want to um, I want to take a look at something a little bit different, and uh, we're going to take a look at three beautiful black lady wrestlers, very uh, under the radar, with fantastic skill and talent. Um, being a, being a black person in the 1950s South under Jim Crow law, which has got to be the biggest black eye on American history um, for the fucked up shit that that pe creep put people through, um, <laughs> um, was very difficult uh, for, for any black person, especially a woman, because white women didn't even have the proper rights in the 1950s as a man either. So it was a heavily white male dominated country. And if you were a woman, you're below. And if you're black, you're definitely below us type of attitude in certain parts of the, of our country. They had to fight and they had to scrape and they had to do whatever they had to do just to make it through to the next day, just because of their skin color. But that, did not stop a very determined Miss Babs Wingo, if I can get this to stay up. Miss Babs Wingo, right here. Try. Sorry about the glare. <clears throat> Babs would go on to be the first black female uh, wrestler in the 1950s. Come on, I'm trying to get this this day. There's several black ladies being featured here, and uh, we're, we're just going to focus on three of them for right now. Um, Babs started, she'd go down in history as the first black female wrestler. Um, she started under Billy Wolf and got extremely popular. Um, Mildred Burke had trained her. She would, uh, she would be no, the first black female to ever challenge for the NWA world title, for the ladies world title, and that was huge. Because like I was describing earlier, for those of you who don't know what Jim Crow, Jim Crow law is, uh, black people can't eat here. Black people can't drink out of that fountain. Black people can't be on that side of the sidewalk. Shit like that. Ridiculous shit. So for uh, in certain parts of the country, Babs was not allowed to wrestle a white wrestler. She could only wrestle a black wrestler. So she was responsible for getting girls like Kathleen Wimbley uh, into the sport um, and many, many others. She had brought in a lot of her friends and they all became wrestlers. They all became very successful, all because of Babs starting out this trend. Um, so it was very difficult for her to even make it. Uh, for one, being a black woman, being held down just for being a woman and on top of it for being a black woman, um, she, she had balls big enough to come in a dump truck for, for doing what she did and trailblazing the way she did and wouldn't take no for an answer. Um, so yeah, she would be not only the first black wrestler, the first black female to wrestle for the NWA world title, which is, like I said, a very big deal. I mean, it had to be t horrifying to be a black person in Jim Crow areas in the country in the 50s. Uh, and then add being a woman on top of it. I, I mean, like I said, she had to be the most fearless woman on the planet. Uh, many tried to, to steer her away and tell her not to do it, but you weren't going to stop a supernova like her. Um, not only were you not going to stop her, uh, she was about to multiply. And uh, I'll explain in this magazine right here as we take a look. Oh, it stays out too. As we take a look at Miss Ethel Johnson. Ethel Johnson is the younger sister to Babs Wingo, who we just looked at. And uh, she made her debut in 1952, just two years after her sister Babs. 
and uh, she trained also under Mildred Burke and was uh, you know brought in by uh, Billy Wolf. She started when she was 16, served uh, two years under uh, Camp Mildred and uh, learned the basics and stayed and trained and worked out and um, climbed her way. And uh, by 1952, she's making her, her debut. Um, she'd be best known uh, for inventing the standing drop kick. So it was Miss Ethel Johnson who invented the standing drop kick. She, and um, in her time period also, you know, couldn't wrestle other white people in certain parts of the town, certain towns. So she wrestled her sister Babs a lot uh, and her other friend, uh, uh, Kimber, uh, Kathleen Wembley, who was, I just showed pictured. Um, they would have a lot of uh, two, uh, three woman um, Texas tornado type matches, like three on, on each other. They would have uh, uh, what they would call a four woman, four woman battle royal, which is be four girls wrestling at the same time, not really a battle royal. Uh, or they would have four man, four woman tag teams. So they would go on the road and take that tag team, and that would become huge. And fans absolutely ate it up. Um, she would, uh, um, she, like I said, she was credited for the for the standing drop kick. But her biggest achievement of all would becoming the first black female NWA World Champion, becoming a tag team partners with June Byers. So she was the first black female to ever hold the, an NWA title, world title, as a tag team. She uh, partnered up with June Byers and she defeated um, Penny Banner and Betty Jo Hawkins uh, in 1956. So uh, big credit right there for a black woman to become uh, a champion and to see a, a champion. Um, but it wouldn't be the only title she would hold. She would hold several others. Um, she would be a two-time Texas Women's Champion. She'd be, listen to this, three-time colored woman's world champion. Really? A colored woman's world champion? Why don't you just call her woman's world champion? Um, but things were segregated and separated and, and stupid little things like that. You know, I don't see her as a black wrestler. I see her as a wrestler. You know, it's just how I look at it. I don't look at this guy as a, as a black wrestler. You know, he's a wrestler. It just, you know, there's no reason to put a color in front of it or, or you know, that, that's dividing us and there's enough of that already going on. Um, she's also a two-time Ohio State uh, Women's Tag Team Champion, where she spent most of her time uh, living uh, in the Ohio area uh, with her two kids. So she went on to have a lot of success. The WWE completely, completely slapped uh, the, the, the Wingo family, that's, they're all sisters, uh, in the face. And we'll get to that in a minute from what they did for the WWE's bogus Hall of Fame there by getting the names wrong and, and the titles wrong of these women. It's just ridiculous. And them refusing to make the corrections at, at the time when they should have is even more of a slap in the face to the family. But uh, like I said, we'll, I'll tell you more about that in a sec. Um, and there was other black women here featured. Um, there's another young, beautiful girl named Marva Scott. And we're gonna look at her right now. Voila, introducing Miss Marva Scott. She would become the first black female to ever pose for the cover of a major mag wrestling magazine. And until this day, I mean, well, I can't say to this day, but somewhere in the 2000s when I stopped looking at wrestling magazines, uh, Marva stands alone from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, I don't know how far into the 2000s. I'm sure I would hope they put another black female on the cover by now. But uh, Miss Marva Scott stands alone on having that title. There was another black girl on the cover. We'll see her in 1972, but uh, Marva was the first one to pose for a cover. And here you'll see she wanted Mula's title. And here she is inside the magazines looking to come after Mula. And just a two page spread for Miss Marva Scott when she would dye her hair blonde sometimes, which I thought was really cool, uh, March of 1976. Miss Marva. <clears throat> so I was telling you about the, uh, the four woman tag team, the four woman Texas Tornado style matches that they had. And we're gonna take a look. And this issue is an extremely hard issue to find. This is called Girl Wrestlers. It came out in 1956. 
Uh, I stated before, this is probably my most expensive magazine that I have and also the hardest magazine it, there is to find. Uh, I didn't know that. I had a copy of it and I was told that later on. This sells for you know several hundred dollars. Um, if you can even find one, it's extremely hard to find. Sepia Girl Battle Royal, which just means brown or dark, which is kind of a stupid title if you ask me, Sepia Battle Royal. But here's the girls in a Battle Royal uh, type match of five. And we have Babs Wingo, Betty White, Louise Brown, uh, Brown Green, sorry, uh, Kathleen Wembley, and Ethel Johnson at the bottom here. And they're in their Battle Royal. And it was a big attraction. People in the crowds loved it. Went over big. And these four would wrestle all over the country with the same show. And they got a really nice spread in this magazine. Upwards to eight pages long. And not counting the article later on. Pretty cool shot of these trend-setting black ladies. Uh, not only these three black ladies but for all the black ladies who had to fight through racism and sexism and you know in a male dominated sport where you were looked down upon uh, during a time when the segregation laws were extremely enforced uh, you know Babs Marva and and Ethel were among the highest paid black uh, athletes in the country uh, and yet their fans weren't even allowed in certain arenas to come see them because they were black. I mean, how fucked up is that? I mean, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But uh, for all they've done and, uh, you know, their names will um, try to not be forgotten with us. But in the history of professional wrestling, you never hear much ab about these three ladies who, who paved the way for not only black ladies, but other ladies that come after them. Um, they never really got the credit that they deserved. And when it came time to getting the credit that they deserved, the WWE totally slapped the family across the face with the most insulting, um, I don't even know what to call it. You know, they got, the, the, they got Babs listed as one thing. They have Marvel listed as another and Ethel's title as another. And it's just totally screwed everything up. The wrong people, the wrong credits. And it truly, truly hurt the family. Um, I became friendly with Marva Scott's uh, beautiful daughter, uh, Kim. And, uh, and Kim has, has said how, how disgusted in the WWE and how they reached out to them only with a small apology without making the proper corrections during the WrestleMania and uh, it's just really a shame. And, and, and as I promised you, Kim, I would do my best to honor your mom and to honor your aunts uh, with the utmost respect that they deserved. And everybody here on my channel will certainly show the respect to those beautiful ladies uh, that they deserve. Uh, I just hope that the WWE and their so-called bogus Hall of Fame will uh, do the right thing and, and make things right for you and your family. So, uh, Thank you, Miss Kim, for all the information and time you spent with me discussing things about your mom and your aunts. It's, it's much appreciated. And it was my pleasure to show these beautiful ladies and honor them for all that they have done in the sport of professional wrestling. And on that note, something happy, we have to bring it down and get it ugly. Ugly as in the ugly moolah. But let's take a look at ugly moolah before she was ugly. Here is a 1951 issue. Actually, this is issue number one. I was just telling you earlier, wrestling. This is issue number one of the very first wrestling magazine ever printed. This went from January till April. And they are, they should be sued for being deceiving of showing an almost attractive looking fabulous moolah here. Only this is pre-fabulous moolah. This is a uh, slave girl moolah. So um, she was actually, you know, kind of cute looking uh, in 1949, 1950. She started out as slave woman mola or slave girl. And she was a valet to the elephant boy. And this earliest I have for mola looking like that is this issue 
of Wrestling As You Like It, September 22nd, 1951, with Luthez, NWA World Champion, on the cover. And there's a small photo in here of Slave Girl Mola and the Elephant Boy, which was her... Uh, she was the valet to, or manager, whatever you wanted to call it. So before Elizabeth did it, the fabulous Mola was doing it uh, in 1949, 50, and 51. And this on the cover of this issue of Wrestling As You Like It. And we're going to get into a lot more stuff with Mola as we get rolling here. But uh, now we're just going to follow it as much as I can in, in order. Um, See, make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Uh, actually, no, it's right, yep, right here. So, Mola in 1956 goes from the slave, uh, breaks the chains of the slave girl and becomes the fabulous Mola. And here is a shot of her leaving the, uh, the, the act behind. And here she is in her match now as the fabulous Mola taking on Judy. Grable. I've got a really cool signed 8x10 of, of Mola and Judy Grable. And Julie's get, she's getting her head squeezed and she's gritting her teeth. It's a nasty picture. I should have brought it over and showed it. Um, another shot of Mola here getting rubbed out at the end with getting her, uh, her neck rubbed out. Um, I think there's a few more in here. These are real early shots of, of Mola in her first couple matches. Sorry, hold on. Um, there's a really cool shot here I want to show you too that I'm trying to get to uh, right here where she's getting carried off by the cops. Uh, pretty cool looking shot. Quite becoming of the maniac Mola that she'd become later on. I always thought that was a great shot and you'd never really see that picture anywhere else. I would love to have an 8x10 of that shot. And continuing on here and right here taking on Pat Sherry. We're going to talk about her in a few minutes, too. So there's your first look at Mula, 1956. Took a little while for her to hit the magazines. She's not quite uh, the name yet because she just turned wrestler. Um, in 1956, she decided to drop the uh, gimmick of uh, the chains and decided to turn into a pro wrestler. So she signed a deal with Vince McMahon. I'm just trying to get you something to look at while we're here. Um, she signed a deal with Vince McMahon uh, and Capital Wrestling Corporation in September of 56. She would have uh, be a part of a 13-woman um, battle royal and the finals two girls, uh, which would be Judy Grable and uh, Mula, would become the recognized world ladies champion. Mola squared off against uh, Grable and here she is right here because you can tell this Grable always had bare feet and Mola becomes the new world champion. So now we have three ladies champions out there. Uh, the fabulous Mola who was going to be basically up in the northeast territory and a few southern uh, places in between. Um, June Byers, who would be the NWA champion. And now we have uh, Mildred Burke, who is the world women champion, world women wrestling champion. So there's three of them floating around now at one time during the 1956 period. And this would go on for another eight or nine years uh, this way. Um, the the Moolah's belt was not recognized by the NWA, by Billy Wolf or anybody else. It was just recognized by uh, Vince McMahon. And in a couple of short years, it's not going to matter because Vince McMahon's territory will be on their own and the Worldwide Wrestling Federation would take off and Moolah would have a steady home for the rest of her life from that point on. So I think it was a contract well signed uh, on her behalf. So that gets us caught up to a lot of the history that I wanted to get out of the way just to let some of you guys know what was going on beforehand so you got to know the matches and the people and who became champ and who became champ after what and all the crazy shit that's mixed in between. I could have just showed you guys a couple of magazine covers and been done already. Uh, instead, I'm 40 minutes into it and I showed you three magazines. But I thought it was important to 
you know, get that out of the way to let you see uh, the importance. Now we're going to fly through some of the magazines and see the, how the ladies were treated on the covers of the magazines. And you'll see not quite very good unless they were being covered by the ring wrestling. They covered women's wrestling the best. So uh, first time the woman, a woman wrestler would be featured on the wrestling world is issue number one, September of 62. And it's a real small shot of Rita Cortez right here. If you blink, you miss it. Really small shot of Rita on the bottom. Not very appealing and very small as you can see. The next lady uh, on the cover would be Miss Penny Banner. And on top of her is the Nature Boy Buddy Rogers. And again, a real small shot. But we're gonna open it up a second. This is November of 1962's issue of Wrestling Worlds, issue number two or three. Uh, inside, is Penny Banner, and she's taken on Ethel Johnson, who we just talked about a few minutes ago. Ethel is challenging Penny Banner right now for the AWA Ladies Champion. What, there's four lady women's wrestling champions? Yep, there's four, because the AWA formed, and they created their very first champion, which is Penny Banner, and here she is. And there's a full page, it goes on for another three or four pages with Penny, uh, good articles in here about Penny, how she got started. Not so much talking about the match with Ethel at all. Uh, that match took place uh, December 10th, 1961, at the, um, at the uh, Fairground Coliseum in Indiana for NWA Detroit, and it was for the AWA ladies title. This. Moving on, uh, issue number, <clears throat> I think, four, four, for uh, the ring wrestling, and this is May 63's issue, and it's got uh, Judy Grable on the front cover. Not quite a, you know, crystal clear shot, it's more of the stenciled in colored pencil uh, cover that the ring was known for for majority of their boxing covers, but nonetheless, they have two women on the cover. Wait, is this issue number? No, this is issue number one. I was looking at it backwards. This is issue number one, very first issue of the ring wrestling. Be prior to May of 63, the ring had uh, boxing uh, and, a, and a small section of uh, wrestling in the back. It wasn't really a combo mag, but they covered a lot of wrestling. So your prior information from 63 down is in the ring boxing. This is the first issue of ring wrestling, strictly only wrestling. Uh, the second issue, July, and it's got, oh, it's got the, uh, the passing of uh, Billy Wolf and it discusses his life uh, in pretty good detail with his family and discussing about the Thursday night, March 7th, 1963, Billy suffered a heart attack. Um, there's great loss to the wrestling, blah, blah, blah. So the whole story uh, is in this issue uh, of the ring wrestling, it tells you more about promoter, manager, and what other names people may have for Billy Wolf passing away. December 1963, and we have our first look at the fabulous Mula on the cover of a magazine. And she's taken on uh, Rita Cortez, and she doesn't get the headline. It just says, the weaker sex, not wrestling Mula, I guess. So it's uh, not really about her, about her ability. It's just more of a, an exploit. A lot of the stories that they cover the women on are really stupid. So I didn't bother showing every single cover a woman was on because they had a picture of it and it'll say, uh, should this woman be a wrestler or is she tough enough for this? It's like nonsense. I want to hear about the match. Tell me who's wrestling who, what match and where at and what championships on the line. We don't care about the, you know, the, the stupid, you know, confidential stuff you're, that you're trying to exploit. It just doesn't really work, especially in a sports magazine. We don't want to hear it. Um, December 1963 Wrestling Review, the barefoot Judy Grable on the cover. We're going to discuss all three Grables in a second. There is a mix up with the Joyce's. And people get that confused, and we're going to cover that in just a few minutes. Um, let's see. February of 1964, The Ring, and oh, uh, discussing uh, Penny Banner and the uh, AWA Championship and her defenses. I thought there may have been something else in here, but possibly not. Okay. Um, oh, and this is uh, a bad picture. I 
I have another copy of it. I should have been here. Penny Banner was no, was known this, in this picture. This is their idea of a color photo in the magazine. It looks awful. It's not in the right order. I have another picture. She's known for being the first female wrestler to wrestle in a two-piece bikini bathing suit. No one has ever done it before. And it was Penny that did it. And talk about controversial. The magazines ate it up. The newspapers ate it up. And she got a lot of attention for wearing that. Um, 19 February uh, February is it yeah February 1964 and we have another information here about women in action nobody in particular but this will be the last issue wrestling world from 1964 to 2003 is what I basically have up to uh, and there's not another woman on the cover that's it nothing through the 80s 70s nothing uh, not until they got to like 2000, they put like, you know, girls that really weren't wrestlers, like like DDP's wife or and, uh, Stacey Keebler, kind of shit like that. There was, wasn't really, they were, they were in the WCW, so they really weren't wrestling, you know, just exploiting girls with their tits hanging out like that major guns girl. I mean, they, you know, they're not, they're not wrestlers. They weren't, you know, nobody that did anything for anybody. Um, 1964. We got uh, Mula and uh, Judy Grable on the cover. Mula explains why she hates Grable on the cover of Wrestling Review. The Ring Wrestling, 1964, December. And this has got a pictorial of uh, ladies wrestlers from different time periods, uh, from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And it just shows a bunch of different ladies uh, in here. It's one of the most, uh, at the time, the bigger ones at the time. 280 pound lady monster. Um, 210 pound Amy Rom uh, Ann Rommel, pretty big ladies. Um, here is Cora Livingston, retired world ladies champion on her horse. So there's a bunch of different ladies from, there's some from Germany and some from Russia. Um, and can anyone recognize this Scarlet is Miss Johnny May, or to you guys, May Young. Uh, actually looking young and cute and posing to the side. And what a career she would go on to have. What a kook. Wrestling Review, April 1964. And Penny Banner taking on uh, uh, Mary de Leon. Wrestling Confidential actually shows the first two lady wrestlers, actually a tag team, uh, that dominates the cover. So this is your first dominated shot uh, outside of the ring, I should say. Uh, this is Complete Sports Wrestling Confidential 1964. Pretty good shot there of the lady wrestlers. Another shot of Wrestling Confidential, Moolah coming out of the shower. I don't know to look or hide my eyes or what, I'm not sure. Um, Kind of a rare issue to find. Also, Cowboy Bob Ellis is uh, with her on the cover. And Lady Wrestling inside. Uh, here you see the fabulous Mula, June Byers, uh, Ethel Johnson. And we are looking for an open fight for women to wrestle in New York. They're tired of the ban uh, for not having wrestling in New York. And there's a big article in the ring issue discussing about how they're fighting it and taking it uh, to the highest uh, courts and trying to get it approved. Um, February 1965, Barbara Baker, not Mona Baker, Barbara Baker wins the uh, U.S. Uh, tag uh, heavyweight uh, title for the ladies. I keep saying heavyweight, but they sometimes consider the ladies heavyweight championship belt because there wasn't any underweights and any weight would hold it. But uh, sometimes I just say heavy, but it's not really the proper name. Um, but again, Barbara Baker wins the U.S. title on the cover here, Wrestling Review. Betty Bosher on the cover of uh, April 65, uh, The Ring. The Ring covered more ladies than any, so every single issue had ladies inside of it if they didn't have them all on it. So you can't go wrong if you're a lady wrestling fan uh, with The Ring any time in the 60s and the 70s, it was all women wrestling. Um, Stanley Weston had just finished uh, Wrestling Review sold the company and then put out a couple of independent magazines, one called um, 
uh, girl wrestling and the other one was wrestling illustrated these ran simultaneously there's only like three of these this is issue number one and it's got uh inside it's got uh judy grable uh ann casey and uh, penny banner inside uh, these again i don't like to take these out i like to keep them because they're they're mint and i want to keep them mint uh they're really getting hard to find um I have a couple of issues, some of these are of each. Here's another shot of Judy Grable, Rita Cortez on the cover, spring of uh, 65. Um, I think I have, on the back they would have the ratings, uh, Penny Banner, the fabulous Mola. Um, see, so uh, Mola number one, Judy Grable number two, Rita Cortez, Penny Banner. The list goes on to the top 10 uh, lady wrestlers that were on the back cover. Uh, but it's the only reason I showed that one twice because I had the, the board out of the back removed from it. So uh, Penny Banner um, taking on, uh, it is Judy Grable because I couldn't see what her shoes line on. Um, fall of 65 Banner is taking on Judy uh, in the AWA. Uh, this is the issue number three. Like I said, they only made three of these. Um, then they combined it with... Uh, girl wrestling and wrestling illustrated they made it combined with one and i hated these there's only three of these i'm only going to show you one because they really weren't worth talking about this is penny banner high heels in a bikini uh, a couple of uh you know outrageous stories just for exploitation and just you know more like a tabloid than it is a wrestling magazine didn't care for any of those three at all the fabulous mula on the cover here of uh, october of 65 the ring, that's a great looking cover. <clears throat> Pat Sherry on the cover of Wrestling uh, Review, 1965. Pat Sherry is the fabulous Moolah's daughter in the blonde right here, very young in her career. The very first wrestler number one, uh, October 1966, and inside has a false uh, story on uh, Mildred Burke, Queen of the Mat, and uh, good story in here if you want to read up on Mildred. The only down part is it's an issue number one and it's extremely expensive. Uh, June Byers on the cover, Ladies Champ, just now about to retire. And who is the real Ladies Champ? Uh, the real story here is... California wrestlers, uh, they ret women wrestling returns to California for 22 years. So the ban in California has been lifted and it's all covered in this issue of the ring. It's also about the ladies champ. The, uh, right now there would be only one ladies champ. Um, June Byers would have retired. Uh, Mildred Burke retired and it's just the fabulous Mola now all alone defending the ladies belt as she sees fit. She's pretty much got the whole monopoly now on under her belt. And if you want to wrestle, you've got to go through Moolah. And you want the belt, you got to beat Moolah. So very tough challenges ahead for lady wrestlers for sure. April of 1966, Wrestling Review, and it's a good shot of the fabulous one. Mona Baker on the cover now, a fighter of the year, not to be mistaken with Barbara Baker, the Canadian uh, on the other page. Pat Sherry, uh, Mola's daughter, poolside in this issue of The Ring. Fabulous, uh, not fabulous, Mola, Mildred Burke, uh, her own story here, listed on Wrestling Review with the maniac Mark Lewin on the cover of Wrestling Review, August of 1966. Sex and the Girl Wrestler. See how like the exploit uh, titles, that's a million of those out there. So I didn't bother really showing any of them, but uh, this is just showing some different gal wrestlers as they say it um, inside. You got some different ones. Uh, Marva Scott is here who we talked about. Betty Hawkins is here. Uh, Miss Bell, I can't remember her first name. Bell, uh, oh geez, uh, Bell something, forgive me. Um, it goes on a few pages, but uh, this covers, I think, another six pages of just girl wrestlers who were hot at that moment. Uh, the wrestler number two talks about uh, the band in New York and about lifting the band in this issue here of Wrestler. This is February of 19, dates on the side, sorry, 1967. Uh, this is, like I said, number two. And it talks about the New York band, and it's time to lift the band soon, but not quite. 
wrestler number three, which would be April 67, Penny Banner taking on Judy Grable on the cover. Now you'll start to see a lot of recycled stories with Penny Banner and Judy Grable and Mula and Julie Grable. A lot of the matches from the 60s will be on the front covers of a lot of the 70s issues. A lot of repopped stories, so I didn't bother bringing them out to show those either. Um, but they did that a lot. Uh, another a unique shot with Mula here, December, October rather of 67, and fabulous Mula. Um, took us by accident. Uh, wrestler May of 68, and uh, the curse of the Golden Goddess. We're introducing now Joyce Grable, the real Joyce Grable. The real Joyce Grable, his real name is Joyce Fowler. And later, uh, she would get married, and her name would uh, she would change her name, but she was Joy she was the very first Joyce Grable, and she was very pretty. Um, always liked this Joyce Grable um, personally, and this is a story about her and her getting started uh, in this issue of the Wrestler. Um, Here is your first pinup of Joyce Grable. She's a different Joyce Grable than the Joyce Grable of the 70s and 80s. You know, she, I think the other one makes her debut in 73 or 74. Uh, and this Joyce Grable uh, started in the uh, late 60s and, and, and ended it quickly. She was only around for a couple of short years uh, and didn't stick around too long. But very uh, attractive lady. Um, inside, of the, that pinup is in this issue of... Uh, the ring, May of 68, is, is the pinup. But inside this issue, uh, who is the greatest women wrestler? And you have um, June, Mildred, uh, Mula, and also uh, Miss Cora Livingston, once again, the first world ladies champion, still getting recognized some 30 years after her retirement, which is cool to see. And this goes on for several pages. And like I said, the pinup of the uh, younger original Joyce is on this issue. Moving on, uh, Little Cloud blows up a storm on the uh, January 68 review. Uh, February of 1968, and there's another of uh, the illustrated covers, but uh, a lot of, I forget what's in here exactly. There's a bunch of uh, different information with lady wrestlers on it. I just can't remember what was in that one. Um, Cora Combs on the cover again, a rapist invaded my uh, room and it's just uh, I don't know if it's a true story or not the guy came in tried to kiss her and uh, she ended up beating him up and then sat him down on the bed and had a nice long talk with him and then he was on his way so it sounds like one of those kayfabe stories to me not worth really reading uh, August of 68 and Casey gets the cover on a small corner shot you'll see the women aren't getting much coverage small pictures on a Stanley Wesson's especially a uh, small shot here of uh, Penny Banner in the uh, annual of 69 Cora Combs the red hot redhead now no blonde hair for Cora redheaded in April of 69 uh, this is the issue uh, August 69 that talks about the the uh, women's wrestling ban lift in New Jersey. So up until uh, this point, uh, Jersey was banned and now it's lifted. Um, so they're good to go. So it's California and Jersey. So what's New York's problem? They're still banning wrestling. You have uh, October, I'm sorry, December of the ring, 1970, with a uh, four lady match going on. I really can't identify any of them, to be honest with you. Doesn't really give any names. Good looking shot of the fabulous Mula here in January of 70. There were the only two issues for 70 by the, for the ring, by the way. This one and this one, January and then December. And that's it for the entire year. They were mostly a boxing magazine anyway. Didn't really cover a lot of wrestling, but the 60s they did. And they get more later on, but they were never as good as the 60s. The 60s ring was the best. September 1970, got a shot of Mula here with a story uh, on her. Um, Donna Cristatello is on the cover of December 1970 Wrestling Review. New Ladies Tag Team Champions, uh, nuts to women's lib. Uh, introducing new tag team champions, Tony Rose uh, and Donna Cristatello, the new NWA Tag Team Champions. And there's a good, sh good looking shot of the two with their championship belts. 
uh, on the ring, October of 1971. Uh, Maria Vagnon uh, now carrying on the lineage of Mildred Burke. And this is Mildred Burke's championship and the uh, title of the WWC, WWWC, WWL. I won't keep saying that. I know I'm probably driving you crazy with it. Um, that lineage now in Japan, and Maria is now that champion. It will go back and forth with American girls, but they would have to go to Japan to defend it, and, and that's basically where it was going to stay from that point on. This is Wrestling Monthly, November 71. Uh, Miss Maria Laverne, uh, December 1971. Not a great picture of Maria Laverne. She's a very attractive woman, too. Wrestled a lot in Canada with Vivian Fashon. They were teamed a lot, matched a lot. You'll see a couple of them later on. Um, exclusive uh, Betty Nicole speaks out about wrestling in New York State. Um, still arguing the argument with the Senate and trying to get bills passed for wrestling in New York. Out in Los Angeles, we have Miss Sandy Parker, another black female wrestler who was very popular on the West Coast. And this would be your first time seeing a black lady wrestler at, in an actual match. For whatever reason, they black and white it out. Very stupid, on purpose, innocent, I don't know. Um, nonetheless, uh, Sandy Parker is on the cover of a magazine and she was pretty popular up and through like the early 80s too, as, especially like I said, out in, on the West Coast. She's here against uh, Vicki Williams, battling it out on The Wrestler, February 1971. <clears throat> a lot of lady coverage uh, in this issue of December, uh, February rather, 1972. Um, I, I forget what is in there, but there's a, it's the 90% of that magazine's women's wrestling. Um, the evil Natasha is tacking on the lovely Ann Casey on the bottom of March 73. So you'll see women aren't getting much play. You'll know, get a little corner shot, a little piece here, nothing serious at all. Um, but at least they're still being mentioned anyway. March 72, Mascaris gets the main shot. Ann Casey with a big spread leg shot on the front cover. Vivian Fashan with her brothers, the Butcher, um, Paul and Maurice, Mad Dog, uh, March 1971 with their AWA Tag Team Championship belts. And of course, the Fashans had their territory. I think it was Montreal, right? Up in Canada. <clears throat> um, uh, Maria Laverne uh, and Vivian uh, going at it on the cover of The Wrestler. First time Stanley Weston puts two women wrestlers dominating the cover now, since not since 65 issues of the girl issues. So June of 71, he comes out of the bat swinging with the ladies on the cover, which is pretty cool to see for the ladies and the ladies fans. <clears throat> Vivian Vachon again um, on the bottom, real small here. This was June 72. Another ring issue, and this is um, special Mexican. No, this covers more so of the Japanese women coming, uh, the uh, Americans coming to Japan and taking on their champions is all covered here. Uh, and all the Japanese uh, lady wrestlers are in this issue talking about uh, what our girls are going to do when they get there, hopefully taking their titles and vice versa, that kind of talk. Um, Vivian Vachon, again, uh, on the cover, August of 72, to wrestler. End of the Terrible Curse of the Golden Goddesses on the cover, September 1972, The Wrestler. And finally, New York gets their bullshit act together and lifts the ban for lady wrestling. And the first match at Madison Square Garden, Fabulous Mula takes on Vicki Williams. And here is a shot of those two during the, in the ring. Dick Kroll, the referee, George Napolitano snaps the shot. Um, lift and uh, New York band lifts on girls in the ring and finally New York has their act together and like I said oh and George Napolitano thank you very much for watching our wrestling scene video and the nice comment you made uh, all the thanks goes to people like you who made all these photos possible for us to look back and get nostalgic for so the thank, the thank you goes to you and not for me for putting the video up. I, I did nothing. You were there ringside uh, capturing all these great shots for us. So thank you, George. Um, October of 71, also covering the Madison Square Garden shot with Mula and Vicki Williams on Wrestling Monthly. 
November of 72 to wrestle her, the private life of Maria Laverne. And she, there she is in a two-piece bikini. And of course, if you have a half a brain in your head, you're buying it just for that. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, girls tag team match, Maria Laverne and Vachon on the side. December 72, uh, after Mula, who? And it's got uh, Natasha once again on the cover. That's, there will be no one after Mula for the next 10, 12 years, I'm thinking right now yet. Um, what is this issue? Uh, July 73, oh, uh, in this issue, uh, the, uh, the new Joyce Grable is starting to make her appearance. I'll show you her closer as the as we get closer with a better shot. Uh, this issue, Mula wins the NWA Tag Team Championships, and she's pictured here with the NWA Tag Belts uh, while she's still ladies champion. Another shot of Laverne and uh, Vachon on the cover of Yearbook 73. Uh, Sharon Lee now with Mildred Burke's world title. And there is a tug of war for the title. And uh, there's the ladies and the future stars competing for uh, that uh, prized championship belt. Penny Banner gets the full cover of Wrestling Review. Looks more like a country and Western magazine with the horse and the backdrop than it does a wrestling magazine. Um, nonetheless, it's a full spread on uh, uh, Penny Banner, uh, January of 1974. Uh, here's that stupid picture I want to show. I had Penny's autograph, and it says, you know, Penny Banner, AWA, Champ, 1963. And uh, when, she, uh, when she lost the title in 63, uh, I think she gained it in 61. Um, but this was the one I wanted to show with the, uh, the match when she was with Ethel Johnson. Um, she has the two-piece bathing suit, and that's the suit that she wore her first time in a bikini. Um, I have a bunch of autographs. I was going to show them, and I decided not to. I probably should have showed a couple because I could have put a couple with the magazine covers, but that's all right. Vivian Vachon gets her great shot on the cover. Uh, Wrestling Queen becomes a uh, sex symbol. February 1974, Wrestling Queen is the name of the movie she's in. I would suggest it, checking it out. It's totally dated. It's kind of, you know, along the lines of I like to hurt people, but still it's captured some great Montreal wrestling and uh, wrestling at that time period. Uh, especially listening to uh, Vivian talk and hearing her uh, discuss about the different matches and watching her act. It's pretty cool. It's definitely worth checking it out. And it was on YouTube a while ago, Wrestling Queen. Donna Cristatello gets uh, another cover. Uh, it's been four years since we've seen her, and she's on the cover of January 74. Uh, wait, you'll see the new girl. Wait till you see the new girl team. Um, the new Joyce Grable and Vicki Williams become tag team champions, and it's covered in this issue here, January 74, The Wrestler. <clears throat> uh, complete wrestling roundup with the fabulous Mula showing uh, her belt for the first time or the second time now. She wasn't on the cover much with her belt. She gets one other shot, but you can hardly see it. I think it's coming up pretty soon. Uh, May of 74, again, with the, uh, the same matches with the Golden Goddesses. That was just another story from a... The other story, it's reprinted on this issue's publication. June 74, here's Mula. You can't really tell what the suit she's wearing because it kind of blends with the red, white, and blue belt she's got on. But uh, Mula uh, stays truly fabulous. And Wrestling Review, June 74. Vicki Williams, Donna Cristatello on the cover, uh, talking about the Tag Team Championships um, in the ring, uh, 74 July. Laura Del Rio now with Mildred Burke's WWC Real Women's Title World Title of uh, August of 1974. I was told that this was Mill Mascaris's sister. I was never able to find anything written to prove that. Can't find much on anything with Miss Del Rio as it is. She's pretty much a ghost, so uh, really it's hard to find information out on her. But apparently it was... Uh, held Mildred Burke's title. Um, uh, Donna Cristatello, once again, on the cover of August 1974. And here's the new tag team champions. Uh, this is the new Joyce Grable, different than the one we've seen in the 60s. 
Um, this is the one you'll see from now to the 80s, uh, 85 or 6, somewhere all around then is when uh, when she came to the WWF, she was a heel, uh, and then she came back later on. She was good. I remember her getting booed a lot in Philly. Uh, that's just what stands out the most to me to her. I've always preferred the other one more, but, uh, you know, this is November of 1974, and they're showing the new ladies' champions on the cover. <clears throat> um... December 1974 with a girl battle royal on the bottom. Here's a unique one. Uh, not only women, but midgets. Midget, uh, midget ladies dominate the cover of Complete Wrestling Roundup. A little bit of a tougher issue to find from what I remember. Uh, and not that cheap when you do find it. February 1975. And it's got uh, Diamond Lil and uh, uh, Darlin Dagmire. Diamond Lil was uh, the fabulous mole, was pretty much adopted... Uh, kid, as, we, as she just described her, but she really wasn't her adopted kid. Um, here is uh, Vicky and the fabulous Moolah once again at the Garden in a repeated show on the annual award uh, issue 75. Fabulous Moolah is in this issue, but that's not her. Uh, this discussing uh, the Japanese stars and the feud. Mula's getting ready to lose the title soon. There was there was a build up to this with Mula and some of the Japanese wrestlers. Um, I think it's coming. You'll see it in a couple minutes. Uh, Mula, you don't stay on top for 18 years like I do by being soft. And Casey and coming out with Miss Daisy as her debut. And Casey's getting older. Mula again with her championship belt, Miss Del Rio on the bottom. Uh, this is the issue. Uh, June of 1976, the day Mula lost the title. Uh, information about Mula losing. She would lose the belt four times, I believe, uh, throughout those years. She was never totally undefeated. She would also take the Women's Tag Team Championship twice or three times and the Women's United States uh, Championship uh, two times while she was still ladies champion um wrestling sports stars and uh, 1976 completely dominated uh, cover for susan green up top and the fabulous moolah down on all fours anoki and ali get the main shot of this december 76 issue this is an interesting issue. Happy Humphrey, the, uh, the heaviest wrestler ever, uh, talking about the freaks. And here's a Lady Angel, which would be the first bald-headed lady wrestler. Came out and freaked everybody out. She, she came from the circuses and the freak shows and came out to, uh, to the ring. And, you know, she had that look, and she was definitely scaring people, man. Definitely drew a lot of attention uh, bringing her out. <laughs> Most of them were pretty and, and glamorous. And then here comes the Lady Angel. No teeth, no hair, and... Ripping people up. I guess that would scare a lot of people. Vicki Williams on the cover of The Ring, uh, March 1977. Fabulous Mullet again. April 1977 on Wrestling Monthly. Uh, NWA tag team champ, ladies tag team champions come up to the Northeast and have a title defense at the Garden, pictured here with Vince McMahon Sr., June of 1977. There's also uh, information in this issue about Gino Hernandez beating the Sheik for the U.S. title. Miss Laura Del Rio once again on the far left, June 77. And Casey here, uh, wrestling monthly with the uh, NWA um, uh, United States uh, Heavyweight Championship belt and if you look real close you'll see a little scar here and was a bounty hunter at one time and was shot uh, four times with a nine millimeter to the stomach survived all the shots and came back wrestling man pretty wild lady pretty tough lady too and i was lucky enough to become friendly uh with ann online only became pretty friendly and i just exchanged a few messages and sent her a bunch of pictures and uh her daughter was actually very appreciative i showed her some pictures um of her and her son 
uh, which was her sister's brother, her daughter's brother. And she's like, that's my brother. I haven't seen that picture in so many years. Thanks you for sharing that. You know, it was no big deal. It was just a social media share. I, I privately sent it to her in a message, but they, they thanked me like they were my personal pictures and I took them. I was like, nah, man, no problem. These are in the magazines, you know, but very cool lady. And she gave me a free autograph for all the stuff. And I was just, that was great. I thought it was pretty cool. Very cool lady, man. It's a shame she passed away. Um, Wrestling Monthly, February 1978, and it's got uh, the fabulous Moolah back on the cover again with Grable. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Vicky Williams. Grable, Miss Grable is right here. Joyce, 79, January, and the cover of uh, The Ring Wrestling. Things are about to slow up here, too, for lady wrestling here. Um, signed issue uh, of Judy Martin and Leilani Kai. Leilani Kai's first magazine cover here on the ring. Not a great picture. I do have both ladies uh, in an 8x10 signed Leilani Kai and Judy Martin uh, early on in their career. This wasn't they, when they did that Glamour Girl thing. This was before all that. Uh, so I just thought I would show that because they deserve a better picture. Leilani Kai deserves, and so does Judy Martin, they deserve a lot more talk than they've gotten. Because in the 80s, women on the magazines almost go extinct. Um, August 1979, the very pretty Debbie Combs on the cover. Uh, Big John Studd also on the cover. August 79, The Ring. And this is also the last issue uh, of The Ring before the new owners. <clears throat> Japan versus America. Champions versus champions. Um, they're all in here in this battling tournament uh, that takes place in Japan. This is an event program. If I can open it, pages are so thick. I um, just want to get to the women. Uh, Mula defending her title. It'll be a title versus title versus the Monster Ripper, who is a, a female wrestler. That's their lady tag team champions. Leilani Kai, Judy Martin, uh, all on their way to Japan. And here is the monster. She's also, um, she all, I believe she held the WWF Heavyweight Championship as well. Um, I know she won the Puerto Rico title, WWC, several times. Uh, animal, animal this monster woman is. And I think Mula got her hands on her. This is in 1979. Pretty cool tournament, pretty cool tournament to uh, have a program for. Uh, extremely expensive from what I hear. I uh, happened to notice someone said that there were some beat up copies, you know, selling them sort of upwards to 200 bucks. And um, this is something that I never even really took care of. It was just like I'm just throwing around my, my boxes for over the years, but pretty cool. I'm glad that uh, I have one of those. Um, so that would be it for uh, the, the 70s, um, nothing else printed up until 81. And it would be the ring coming back with uh, the fabulous Mula. And this has got a lot of coverage of Mula inside, talking about her career and her belts and who she faced over the years. So uh, if you like Mula and you like pictures, um, give us one a check. It's also got her at home. And, uh, and then it leads into a bunch of other lady wrestlers, Leilani Kai, Judy Martin, uh, Wayne a Little Heart, uh, the list goes on. There's both Combs, uh, mother and daughter, tag team. Um, there's a whole bunch. Good info in this particular ring issue. If you're a fan of that, definitely grab it. Uh, Debbie Combs makes it again on the cover of May 84 Official Wrestling. All-Star Wrestling, she's not really a wrestler, but she certainly should have a little bit of credit for all she's done. Uh, Kevin Sullivan's former wife, the Fallen Angel and Woman is what I know her as, and um, June of 1984, along with Billy Jack. Lady Tag Team Champions, Princess Victoria, uh, and Velvet McIntyre on the cover. Is a uh, yeah, it's the NWA Tag Team Championship, yep. Um, let's see. Introducing Miss Susan Starr on the bottom of November of 84, official wrestling. Uh, 84, you'll have a few people on the cover. Now that was just the third one in a row. And then it goes extinct again. Uh, this is a WWF company magazine, but it's got one director defeating uh, the fabulous Moolah coverage in this issue, which you don't find much of in the magazines either because McMahon had his own magazine company and the magazine photographers were banned from ringside so they really lacked in their coverage from like 85 to 89 88 somewhere like that uh, it was real tough uh december of 84 um this is covering wendy rector's uh 
um, uh, beating the Fabulous Moolah, all in this issue of uh, Wrestling All-Stars. Not, not on the cover, but I thought worth mentioning. October 85, when Director now on the cover with the uh, just regaining the title for the second time. So now she's a two-time WWF champion, losing it to Leilani Kai, and then grabbing the title back up again. Misty Blue starts making her name in the magazines in the IWF, some independent wrestling federations that weren't that bad. Uh, they're actually pretty good. They had some local TV. Um, if you can get, even the NWF uh, was pretty good. Even when Director was champion, the NWF was pretty good for a short time as well. Uh, Wendy on the first cover of PWI, she'd be the first woman wrestler to ever appear on a PWI, and this is it, April of 86, PWI, Wendy, first and only woman wrestler to make it on a cover to that point. Another shot of Debbie Combs, double action wrestling in uh, October of 1986. Misty Blue back again on the cover, wrestler January 87. Complete uh, Wrestling uh, Power, I'm sorry, Your Guide to Wrestling's Greatest Females on the cover of Wrestling Power 1987, December's issue, and the entire issue is showcasing ladies wrestling. So definitely check this out if you're a fan of 80s wrestling because there was hardly any coverage of ladies wrestling. Um, wrestling All-Stars, Wrestling Scene, same company George Napolitano worked for taking all the great photos for us put out a magazine called um, uh, The Beauties of Wrestling. This is issue number one. It's autographed by Missy Hyatt. It's also got Woman, Baby Doll, and Wendy Rector. And uh, these were not necessarily strictly wrestlers, but they were wrestlers, valets, and any other girl that was inside the somewhat wrestling combat of sports at that time period. Um, these excel for a crazy amount of money. Uh, I had Missy sign that maybe 10 or 15 years ago in, in Pennsylvania at a show. Um, I wasn't going to, and I'm glad I did, because now I heard that also sells for a pretty good buck these days. Double Action Wrestling, got Misty Blue on the cover, and um, just trying to find the exact date here, July of 1988, Double Action. <clears throat> for the first time ever, uh, from the award issues being uh, given to wrestlers since 1972, when it was pre-PWI awards, it went th through wrestling uh, annual, and those issues were the awards. Uh, the first time ever a woman takes a uh, prize in a man's category. So uh, Medusa Michelli, who was AWA Women's Champion at the time, would be would take on uh, Rookie of the Year. So she would first time it, w it would usually be you know Woman of the Year, Woman Wrestler of the Year, blah blah. This is the men's section, and Mula, I'm sorry, uh, Medusa uh, won the award as Rookie of the Year for over men and women. First time they've ever done that. I'm not sure if they ever done it again because uh, I don't my awards only go up to like 93 and I stop. The match that they wanted, that never happened. Sherry Martell at least needs to be acknowledged. She was a fantastic lady wrestler, AWA ladies champion to take on the pretty, the beautiful, the quiet, the shy Miss Elizabeth. And no, the match never happens. Um, I honestly don't even know what was happening then because I was so far removed from the WW cartoon at this point. So I couldn't even tell you what happened. I know they didn't wrestle. Um, wrestling Fever. Uh, March of 89, the fabulous Moolah back on top as the queen in wrestling 89. And that would be a wrap for the 89s. So you see nothing at all for lady wrestling in the, in the uh, 80s. 90s, uh, late 80s would introduce to us probably the, the best female wrestler of all time, Miss Manami Toyota. And here she is holding Mildred Burke's title belt lineage to WWC, WWL in Japan, and uh, that title is still going forward today. Uh, Manami was several time winner uh, in that lineage, and uh, she would go down by many as the best res female wrestler of all time. Uh, I have countless 
DVDs of, of just Manami and she's awesome to watch. Sometimes you have to watch it with the volume off because she's a screamer. She screams during 90% of the matches. Sometimes she doesn't scream at all, which is a pleasant, but uh, doesn't take away from her wrestling skills. She's a multiple time champion. This magazine in 1995 is just getting her recapturing the title once again. Um, it's just a good shot of her re-winning the belt and holding it up. Uh, and there it is. So, an hour and 30 minutes. What a painful sit-through for uh, this lady wrestling. It was a lot of information. It was, a, it was tough to put together, and it took me a long time to get this and to present this in the proper way that it needed to be. So I had to backtrack and give you some history. So um, hopefully you guys, you know, are still alive out there and you made it through to the end. Thanks for watching. Uh, to Miss Marva Scott and, uh, and your family, I wish you the best of luck with your venture forward with the WWE and getting the proper recognition that your family, your mother and your aunts all deserve. And uh, I wish nothing but the best for you guys. And I did the best that I could to showcase your family uh, with the utmost respect. So uh, thank you very much for answering all my questions and the time you spent uh, helping me out with this video. And uh, that's a wrap. We'll see you guys on the next.